Hello and how are you? Welcome to this session on pleurisis, where we were going to focus on its pathophysiology and management. My name is Winnie Berawa. Let's begin by defining this disease, pleurisy, is also called pleurisis, pleuritis. It is an inflammation of the tissues that line the lungs and the chest cavity, what we usually call pleura. Pleura has two sides. It contains parietal and the visceral pleura. So the occurrence of pleurisy or pleuritis causes sharp chest pains, what we are calling the pleuritic pain, that usually worsens during breathing or coughing. So as I had explained, that pleuritis is the inflammation of the lining of the lungs and its chest walls. And this linings of the lungs is what we are calling pleura. The pleura are two-sided. It has the visceral side, which is the one touching the lung tissue. And we have the, in, the parietal side, which touches the chest wall. In between the visceral and the parietal pleurals, we have a space that we call the pleural space. And in the pleural space, there's a thin lining of mucus that usually reduces friction and allows easy movement of the two walls during breathing in and out. So in the case of pleuritis, we simply say it's the disease that affects or inflames these two coverings, causing extreme sharp pain that is called pleuritic chest pain and comes worse when the person is breathing or the person exhibits causes of pleuritis. Pleuritis is normally explained to occur mainly in the presence of other pulmonary diseases and in the presence of these other pulmonary diseases, pleuritis comes in as a manifesting condition or as a secondary condition. In this case, in the presence of all these diseases, we can therefore end up with pleuritis and the disease includes pneumonia, tuberculosis, chest injuries, medical conditions that can include systemic lupus erythematosus, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, liver disease, and heart failure. It can happen in the presence of pulmonary embolism, pulmonary abscess, upper respiratory tract infections, and pulmonary neoplasms. Thus, this tells us that for Pleurisy to occur, it may not be an independent primary disease. However, it comes along mostly where there's existence of other infections in the pulmonary system, be it directly in the lung or in other areas. So the occurrence of these other diseases is what leads to development of pleurisy. And these diseases include the highlighted list here, from all the way from pneumonia to TB, chest injuries, other medical conditions, embolism, abscess, and tract infections, all this can elicit pleuritic reactions. And you can have now inflamed pleural, pleural, uh, pleural linings, and it can lead to excess fluid production, causing a state that we are calling here pleural effusion. Pleural effusion basically means uh, accumulation of fluids in the pleural space due to inflammation that causes overproduction of mucus. And as you can see, here is an example of pleural effusion occurrence. It has accumulated in part of the lung ends. So it's present here. Pathophysiology of pleurisy. This explains how the disease starts. And as I was saying, disease of pleurisy occurs in the presence of another disease. So it could be pneumonia, it could be TB or the, of the pulmonary neoplasm or cancers, and this is where the disease sets in. So pleurisy can be caused by a primary pleural disease or secondary to a systemic illnesses like pneumonia, TB, and others. So in the presence of the risk or causative factors, the pleural lining will get inflamed and swell, leading to friction and overproduction of fluids or the membrane might also fail to absorb the secreted fluid and it will start to accumulate in the space. So we are told the beginning point is the 
presence of the causative factors due to the other pre-existing illnesses or conditions that will initiate the inflammation of these pleuras. When that happens, the pleuras end up swelling and increasing friction between the two walls. And as a result, there's overproduction of secretions or overproduction of fluids that might be failed to be absorbed by the membranes and it can end up accumulating in the space. So the changes here lead to pain, what now we are referring to as pleuritic or knife-like pain and accumulation of fluid in the pleural space causing pleural effusion, also leading to the pleuritic chest pain and other symptoms like cough and dyspnea. So here is a summarized uh, explanation of the pathophysiology. So we have irritant, and this irritant is initiating the inflammation of our pleural membranes or initiation of inflammation of the pleural linings, and this causes the pleural lining to become swollen and reddish or red, and the friction between the layers and uh, forms or starts a state that you are calling the friction rub. So the changes here now brings about the extreme pleuritic pain that gets worse with presence of cough or presence of breathing. So basically means in the case of absence of cough and in the case of pausing the breathing cycle, then the patient will not feel the, that much pain as when they are taking a deep breath. So in clinical manifestation of pleurisy, the preeminent symptom is the chest pain, which in this case is pleuritic chest pain that tends to radiate to the shoulders and also the abdomen. There's persistent coughing, there's shortness of breath, and then there's intercostal tenderness when you do chest palpations. The other bit is fever that is increasing temperatures, there's malaise, the status of being generally tired or generally fatigued and body weakness. And then we have increased white cell count. This is originating from the aspect that pleurisy can cause extreme production of white blood cells as a way of protection or as a way of clearing the infection at the site. So when it comes to diagnosis of the disease or diagnosis of pleurisy, we look at different approaches and one of it is through lung exculpation we are, use, we are using a stereoscope and listening to these lungs, you will hear crackling sounds. Under the chest tray, you can see signs of pleural thickening. And on examination of pleural exams, or I mean, sputum examination, you can do culture sensitivity to just determine the presence of the bacteria that are causing this particular pleurisy. There's examination of pleural fluid that is through thoracentesis to just get a sample for for blood smear and culture, sorry, for fluid smear and culture. And then on the aspect of pleural biopsy, you can be able to rule out other diseases like cancers or tumors that could be developing in the area. And lastly, you can do bronchoscopy, and bronchoscopy is necessitated to enable us to visualize the pleural linings and to see where the pleural, uh, the pleural uh, inflammation is taking place. And on key management, there's different approaches, although we will focus more on emphasizing that if someone is treating pleurisy, then you need to focus on treating the underlying cause. Remember, we are saying this comes out strongly due to other illnesses. So in the case, if the disease is tuberculosis, then you have to treat it first. If you're talking about pneumonia or embolism, then you need to approach the causing disease first before you can initiate the other remaining management. So other management can be uh, uh, administration of anti-inflammatory medications or drugs where we talk about to lower the inflammation process. Then we have analgesics, which is to manage pain, that is pain management. Then antibiotics is to infection management and clearance, especially at the pleural areas. And then for the drainage, this is important. That is for the purpose of draining the chest fluid that has accumulated in the pleural space. And we are calling this pleural effusion. The process of draining this can be through a chest tube or the team can do a thoracentesis procedure. Then uh, administration of diuretics is essential, mainly for the purpose of uh, preventing fluid buildup and to drain as much fluid as possible from the area. 
The patient has chest pains and because of this, there is painful respirations for our client. And so the client needs to be put in a comfortable position that will promote aeration, that is adequate aeration. Encourage, if possible, they lie on the affected side so that you can decrease stretching of these pleuras as it shows where there is extreme stretching of the pleuras, then there's increased chances of increasing pain for the patient. But if you lie on the side that is affected, there's limitation on the ability to stretch these walls and so the pain can reduce. And patient education is key, which will help also in pain in health maintenance, sorry. So when you participate in pain education, basically you are enabling your client to understand features about the disease. For example, what causes it? What is the drug management? How, how important is drug adherence? And how best can the client participate in this? So patient education is key, especially before discharge and especially if you have medication that needs to be self-administered. So participate in an adequate um, patient education to enable have proper continuity of care. And the last bit is complications of pleurisy, which can include pleural effusion. This simply means fluid accumulation in the pleural space. A telectasis on the other side refers to collapse, collapsion of airways. And in this case comes more so when the fluid is too much and it ends up occupying the airways, and this case is the alveoli, leading to the alveoli collapsing. Then the other bit is MPMAs, and MPMAs is the presence of pus in the airways due to infections. So pleurisy, if it's prolonged or exists for extreme period of time, it can cause excess pus formation that can actually end up building up in the area, causing a situation we are calling MPMAs. So thank you for staying with me to the end. So remember to subscribe, share, or comment if you really, really enjoyed this video. Thank you and see you in our next lessons. Bye.